So uh, this is uh, the old Victorian hospital where we have our lab at UCL. So uh, what we study in my lab is uh, the uh, host virus interactions with a focus on primate lentiviruses, particularly HIV. And our aim is really to understand how the virus travels from the early uh, fusion event through to uh, reverse transcription in the cytoplasm and then eventually nuclear entry and then integration into chromatin. So we're studying this first part of the life cycle. And one of the reasons that we found ourselves focusing on that part of the life cycle is that I did my PhD in a gene therapy lab. And the thing I took away, I think the most important message I took away from uh, working in that environment, not actually on gene therapy, but in that environment, was that retroviral vector systems, these VSVG pseudotype 3 plasmid systems, are a really uh, a useful tool to study this early part of the life cycle. So I'm guessing you're all familiar with this type of system, but essentially you can split a retrovirus into three different plasmids. You have what's referred to as the packaging plasmid, which contains the enzymes and the structural proteins. You have a genome plasmid, which encodes the viral genome and a marker gene, typically GFP. And then you have an, em an envelope gene. So you transfect these three plasmids into 293 T cells, and virus comes out. And the virus, we typically use a VSVG uh, envelope protein, which is not a retroviral protein, but that allows us to infect any of the cell lines we've ever tried. So you end up with uh, retroviral particles that encode GFP and do not encode any viral genes. So then when you put that supernatant onto fresh cells, then the, the fresh the cells become infected and the infected cells are green, and then you can read those out using flow cytometry. So this is a very uh, quick way to measure viral infectivity. And then typically, we make mutations in GAG, or we knock down proteins by RNAi in the target cells, and we measure what happens to that infection process. And it's a very high throughput, very repeatable uh, assay. So when I was a, a postdoc working with Olivier Danos at uh, Genethon, I did this experiment, and this was, uh, this was the experiment where, if you're lucky in your career, you do one experiment that's really interesting, and this is that experiment for me. And uh, what, what I'm showing here is uh, a titration curve of two gamma retroviruses, two MLVs, that are very closely related. They essentially only differ between two or three amino acids, and you can map this difference to a single amino acid in the capsid. And what I showed at that time was that uh, this particular MLV, NMLV, was very much less infectious in human cells than its uh, very closely related virus, BMLV. And on the vast majority of cells we tried, these viruses are equal tighter, as you might imagine, because they're closely related. So on cat cells, dog cells, bird cells, very uh, similar titers. But on all of the human lines we tested, NMLV was very low titer. And then uh, some monkeys also appeared to be able to do this. So we realized that there was some mechanism that the cells were using, perhaps to protect themselves from infection, that was active against this virus, but not this virus, based on a single amino acid in capsid. So I spent a lot of time then. I collected viruses from all my gene therapy friends. So I collected HIV-1, 2. SIV-MAC is the uh, uh, simian virus that causes AIDS in rhesus monkeys and is the model for AIDS. Uh, equine infectious anemia virus is a horse lentivirus, and you can get vector systems for all of these. And then I titrated them on cells from these different species. So you have humans, a couple of old world monkeys, a couple of new world monkeys, cows, rabbits, cats, and birds, and worked out whether there was this difference between N and B, for example, between HIV-1 and HIV-2, and whether these cells could uh, render the virus low titer. And you can see that some of the viruses are able to infect all of the cells at high titer. And some of the cells, particularly cats, or also dogs, are highly infected by all of the viruses. So they're good controls. And then you can see cases where you get really poor infection. So famously, HIV-1 is very poorly infectious on uh, old world monkey species, HIV-2 also. EIAV uh, and the NMLV do very badly in human cells. And we published a lot of, of uh, papers at this time simply by titrating these GFP encoding vectors onto cell lines from different species and reading out the titer. So we could characterize the block some more. And in, the vast majority, in all cases, pretty much, we could show that the block to infection was due to a block to reverse transcription. So 
HIV carries an RNA genome, which it turns into DNA by the process of reverse transcription. And it seemed that that was the part of the life cycle that was inhibited. So in this case, SIV MAC is much more infectious than HIV-1 on simian cells. And <clears throat> uh, the block is at the point of reverse transcription. So many of us uh, in, who were working in this field at the time became very popular these experiments. There were a number of labs uh, characterizing these phenotypes. And we were all trying to identify the protein, which we referred to as a restriction factor. We called it REF1. The BNASH lab called it LV1. And we were uh, aiming to identify it. And uh, Joe Sadrosky's lab, a very talented graduate student in Joe's lab, Matt Stremlau, cloned the human TRIM5 protein from rhesus monkey cells and showed that this could block uh, infection of HIV-1 specifically. And uh, the paper didn't say that this was the, uh, they had identified LV1 or REF1, but that was clearly the message. And so it turned out that the protein these cells were making was a protein called TRIM5-alpha. So this is TRIM5-alpha. It has a tripartite motif, uh, a ring, a B box, which are, uh, have E3 functions for ubiquitin. So they're, they're a ligase protein, ligase ubiquitin to target proteins. They have a coiled coil, which allows multimerization uh, into dimers first and then higher order multimerization. And then at the C terminus, TRIM5 has a B30.2 price spry. So that's the name of this fold, and it turns out that this is the part that binds the virus. So we and others then went on to demonstrate that uh, all of these restrictions that we defined earlier were, in fact, due to uh, the species variant of TRIM5-alpha in those cells. So, for example, we in the Sadrosky lab identified the cow protein. And so uh, cow TRIM5-alpha can block MLVN, HIV-1, HIV-2, MAC, and EIAV, but doesn't block... MLVB. So cows are protected from those viruses, at least in part through their expression of TRIM5-alpha, and humans are able to protect themselves from MLVB and, uh, sorry, uh, from MLVN and uh, EIAV, but the sequence of TRIM5-alpha in humans is unable to uh, directly interact with those proteins, and so those uh, viruses are able to infect human cells. So the TRIM family is actually quite large. So this is a fairly old slide from a review from Sebastian Nizol, but it serves to show that this uh, tripartite motif, which is a ring, a B box, and a coiled coil, or some variation thereof, is a very common motif in biology. And there are about 100 TRIM proteins in the, sorry, 100 TRIM genes in the human genome that are now known. Many of them are involved in innate immunity or some kind of immune function. Many of them probably are not involved in innate immunity. And I suspect that there is a particular function of the tripartite motif that is useful for several areas of biology. So uh, TRIM5 is up here. You can see it has a ring, which is the yellow. It has a single B box, a coil, and then a price spry. And you can see that the end of the proteins vary, the C terminus, but the N terminus contains some variation of ring B box coil. Some proteins have two B boxes. Some proteins are lacking one or more of the domains. And it's a very uh, diverse uh, uh, motif, and it makes it very difficult to work out pyrology sometimes. So, for example, there is a human TRIM5 protein. There isn't a, a protein in mouse named human TRIM5, but there's a protein called TRIM30, which is probably the paralog of TRIM5. Often you get duplications in cattle of four or five TRIM5s. And so it's, um, it's complicated to work out which TRIM relates to which other TRIM in a different species. But uh, another example of a tripartite motif protein is PML. And, and uh, the reason really to come and talk to uh, Arena and Marrow is to uh, compare the work we've been doing on TRIM5 with their work on PML and to work out whether there's any opportunities for collaboration. So I'm going to talk about uh, TRIM5, uh, three aspects of TRIM5. I'm going to talk about the enzymatic function, the E3 function for ubiquitin. I'm going to talk about the C terminus, which directly binds virus and recognizes it and how that's evolved. And then I'm going to talk about what we've learned about cell biology and HIV biology in general from studying this restriction factor. So a couple of experiments that were performed by our uh, collaborators and, and competitors, probably more, more accurately, in the US from uh, Tom Hope's lab and also from Joe Sadrosky's lab. So Matt, who cloned uh, TRIM5, also set up a very nice assay to study TRIM5 function a biochemical assay where he was measuring what happens to viruses when they get restricted. And what Matt showed was that the presence of TRIM5 just, uh, appears to rapidly uncoat the virus in a, in a proteasome-dependent way. 
So the function of TRIM5 appeared to be to kill the virus by pulling it apart. And that was Matt's uh, message in this paper. And then Tom Hope did this really nice experiment where he used the proteasome inhibitor, MG132, and measured whether that could rescue <clears throat> the infectivity of restricted virus. And uh, many of us had done this experiment, and we knew that you couldn't rescue uh, the infection of MLVN on human cells using the drug. But what Tom did that we didn't do was Tom measured reverse transcription. Uh, mem remember that reverse transcription is blocked uh, in uh, TRIM5 uh, activity. And what, what Tom found was that he could rescue reverse transcription, so the virus could now go further on in its life cycle, could make DNA, but it was still uninfectious. And that, uh, that uh, observation and that assay has been very useful to us, and I'm going to show how we've used that. So when we started at about this time, we had a, a hypothetical model for how TRIM5 worked. We imagined that uh, TRIM5 uh, ubiquitinates through its E3 ligase activity. That had also been shown that it is able to self-ubiquitinate. And we reasoned that that led to a short half-life because it turns over very rapidly in the proteasome. So TRIM5 is doing that all the time. And then if a virus comes along and the TRIM5 can recruit the virus through interaction between the price bri and the capsid, then it can recruit the whole lot into the proteasome. And we reasoned that that could happen very quickly before reverse transcription, and so the virus was unable to reverse transcribe. And we uh, interpreted Tom's observations as showing that if you rescued this complex from the proteasome with MG132, then the ubiquitination events would drive the recruitment of uh, virus to capsid, and the virus would still be blocked, but reverse tr transcription could continue because it was going on inside this uh, coated core. So that was our model where we started. And uh, uh, Joe's lab and Tom's lab as well, I believe, uh, could show that the half-life of TRIB5 was very, very short. But if you treated with MG132, you could rescue the half-life. So the half-life is around an hour. And uh, if you inhibit the proteasome, you can rescue that. Uh, and TRIB5 is not degraded. So uh, to take that further, we wanted to see if we could uh, see ubiquitination of TRIB5. If you run TRIM5 on a gel and blot, uh, this is, uh, there's no good antibodies for TRIM5, so we're using HA tag protein, and you see a single band, no ubiquitin products. But if you inhibit its degradation using MG132 for a time series up to 10 hours, you see the appearance of this ladder suggesting ubiquitination. So to uh, look at that a bit more closely, we're expressing uh, tagged ubiquitin in cells, overexpressing that, and reasoning that those uh, Hiss-labeled ubiquitins will be attached to TRIM5, and then we can purify TRIM5 using uh, uh, beads, nickel agarose beads, which bind the 6-Hiss tag. So if we do that, and then we, so we're immunoprecipitating or pulling down uh, the ubiquitinated proteins, and then we western block with the tag for TRIM5, and we can see this very nice ladder. So that's telling us that TRIM5 is ubiquitinated in cells, and we can see that if we uh, overexpress the tagged ubiquitin. So to consider the mechanism more carefully, we thought we would uh, look at the E2 proteins. So ubiquitination is a process that involves three types of enzymes. There's a, an E1 enzyme um, that uh, carries the ubiquitin, and then that protein passes the uh, ubiquitin to an E2 enzyme, and then in combination with an E3, that leads to ubiquitination of the target protein. So TRIM5 is the E3 in this case, and there are a large number of E3s, a relatively smaller number of E2s, around 50 E2s, and then uh, only one or two E1s. So understanding the E2 enzyme involved in this can be informative mechanistically. So we uh, screened a RNAi library and identified a couple of um, E2 enzymes. So UBC13 was already known to have an association with TRIM5. And uh, we've, we identified another protein called MMS2, which is an atypical E2 ligase that works in complex with UBC13 as a heterodimer. And they tend to lead to uh, lysine 63 linked uh, ubiquitination. And that was a surprise because it's not normally lysine 63 linked ubiquitin that causes recruitment to the proteasome. Nonetheless, uh, we could show that if we uh, deplete 
uh, MMS2. So that's, uh, we're using a quantitative PCR to demonstrate the depletion. And if we do that, we can show that in a similar way to the proteasome inhibitor, we rescue the ability to reverse transcribe, but we don't rescue infectivity when we knock down MMS2. So we recapitulate the effect of inhibiting with the proteasome inhibitor. The same is true if we knock down UBC13. So again, we rescue the ability to reverse transcribe, but we do not rescue the ability to infect cells. It's, the virus is still restricted. So our model for this is that if we knock out the ubiquitination step, the virus still gets coated by the TRIM5, but it is now no longer recruited to the proteasome. So it seems that the uh, restriction process is uh, independent of E2 ligation of ubiquitin, but that process is what leads to recruitment of the proteasome. So <clears throat> uh, if we then do our uh, adding addition of MG132 and the ladders form when we block their turnover in the proteasome, then if we knock down these two E2s, we see that we no longer cause ubiquitination of the TRIM5. Perhaps we get some of the mono, but we don't get the chains. And the same is true when we knock down MMS2. So we're really uh, depleting the ability of TRIM5 to ubiquitinate by knocking down these E2 proteins. Again, we can uh, express 6-his ubiquitin, uh, pull down ubiquitin, and immunoblot for TRIM5, and we see the ubiquitinated protein, and that does not happen if we knock down UBC13 with uh, RNAi. As I said, it's uh, known that UBC13 MMS2 causes a K63-linked uh, ubiquitin, and so if we make a mutation in ubiquitin where we mutate that uh, lysine, which is used to form the chain, and we change it to an arginine, and then overexpress that molecule, that acts as a competitive uh, dominant negative and suppresses the ubiquitination uh, when we overexpress that, and that does not happen when we overexpress the K48R, suggesting that it is a K63 linked chain that is being uh, made on TRIM5. And then finally, if we overexpress that molecule, the, the uh, mutant ubiquitin, we can again uh, rescue the ability to synthesize DNA, but we don't rescue infectivity. So we figure again that we're manipulating the ability to ubiquitinate, and that does not prevent uh, uh, the restriction process, but prevents restriction to the proteasome. So we can now uh, be more clear about the mechanism. There's lys lysine 63 linked chain catalyzed by UBC13 and MMS2 is what eventually drives proteasome recruitment. So <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the C terminus of the protein. Uh, which is a pry spry, or, or in some TRIM5 molecules. So the way that TRIM5 works, it depends on recruiting directly to the viral protein via the pry spry, as I say here. So TRIM5 is an eight exon gene, seven of them coding, and the pry spry is encoded by a single exon at the end. So while we were all furiously cloning different TRIM5s from different species, Jeremy Lubin and uh, Jonathan Stoy's labs both identified a peculiar variant of TRIM5, which uh, Jeremy called TRIM-SIP, and he found that in owl monkeys. And in this protein, they no longer had a pry spry. The pry spry uh, exon was still there, but was not used because a cyclophilin cDNA had landed in the TRIM5 locus and modified the gene such that instead of encoding a pry spry at the end, it encoded a cyclophilin A. And now that gene restricts viruses that recruit cyclophilin A. So that's quite a, a remarkable uh, bit of evolution where a domain has been swapped out for another protein. Cyclophilin is a prolylisomerase enzyme. And it was even more remarkable when uh, five labs, in fact, all more or less at the same time, identified a similar molecule in old world monkeys, in macaque species. So we identified a rhesus protein uh, and uh, five labs identified a similar protein in which the cyclophilin cDNA was in a different place telling us that swapping out the pry spry for a cyclophilin had occurred twice independently during primate evolution, suggesting that uh, making this manipulation was a particularly advantageous for these two primate species at some point in their evolution. So the question is, why swap out uh, the pry spry, which seems to be a very good binding domain? Why, why swap that out for cyclophilin A? Uh, 
Well, we think we're beginning to understand that now, but one reason is that it turns out that cyclophilins are very good at binding capsid proteins of lentiviruses. So they certainly, cyclophilins bind HIV-1. Turns out they also bind the feline immunodeficiency virus, FIV, and some SIVs also, uh, notably SIV tantalus, SIV from tantalus monkeys. So uh, we had cloned these, uh, we had these two, uh, two trim sips in the lab, and we can uh, uh, measure their antiviral activity. We could show that the owl monkey trim sip restricted FIV, a cyclophilin binder, a couple of HIV ones, but it didn't restrict <coughs> HIV2, which is more or less what we expected because we knew HIV2 was a very poor cyclophilin A binder. However, the rhesus trim sip seemed to have a different antiviral specificity. Firstly, it could distinguish between two, uh, the, the common uh, strain of HIV, M group, but uh, didn't restrict that, but was pretty good at restricting most of the O group strains we tried. Uh, and it also restricted HIV too. So that was a surprise. So there was this idea that these virus, these antiviral proteins had different antiviral specificities despite having the same C terminus which bound the virus. And the reason for that was quite straightforward. The rhesus uh, trim sip protein, or the cyclophilin on the end of the rhesus trim sip, is a different sequence to the rhesus cyclophilin A. It's got two changes implying that uh, during the genesis of this gene or um, afterwards, the cyclophilin sequence was changed, allowing an alteration in antiviral specificity. And that, uh, was, uh, that hypothesis was uh, supported by binding data that we did with our collaborators, uh, Leo James in Cambridge at the LMB. So Leo's a biophysicist, and uh, this is an ITC experiment uh, it's quite straightforward. We simply make recombinant proteins and mix them together and measure their binding and you can get a KD value. And he could show that the cyclophilin A that has a D at 66 and an R at 69 bound HIV-1. But if we made the two changes that were found in the rhesus trim sip protein, then we found that it now switched binding to HIV-2 with a similar KD. So it seemed that this virus, uh, this antiviral protein could uh, target different viruses simply by changing its sequence. And the story was more complex than that, it turned out. So Leo started solving, uh, Leo's a crystallographer, and he started solving uh, crystal structures of capsids that were restricted in complex with the cyclophilin domains. And he could show that the rhesus trim sip protein formed pretty different conformations when it bound HIV2 or whether it bound the HIV1 O group. So you can see this yellow domain is shifted right over. And the fact this is the same, the same molecule but it just forms a different structure when it complexes with these two capsid proteins. And so uh, we assumed that the, the, these two changes that occurred in the rhesus trim sip in the cyclophilin actually gave it this property of uh, conformational diversity. So it's actually evolved to be able to restrict lentiviruses from two different lineages by making a couple of point mutations which allow it to go between these two uh, complexes. So uh, Leo, in collaboration with Stefan Freud at the uh, LMB and the, the uh, Department of NMR, also uh, performed some NMR experiments. I'm not too comfortable talking about these. I don't really understand the experimental process of NMR. But essentially, these experiments show that this cyclophilin molecule is actually conformationally diverse in uh, solution and can make these changes, and that the cyclophilin A molecule, the wild-type molecule, does not do that. So this is a very plastic molecule that has evolved to be conformationally diverse, allowing it to restrict viruses from different uh, lineages. So uh, we are very taken throughout all of this work by Lee Van Valen's Red Queen hypothesis. So uh, Lee worked on uh, evolution and was studying species extinction events, so not uh, studying anything really related to molecular virology, and yet the hypothesis of the Red Queen that he came up with, very, we were very struck that it uh, very well describes the findings that we were making on this interaction between host and virus. So the Red Queen comes from uh, Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass, and in it, the character, the Red Queen, says to Alice that it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. And so the Queen has to keep running in order to stay in the same place. And so Lee likened this to the relationship that exists between hosts and their pathogens. So he said for an evolutionary system, which is also true for the host pathogen virus relationship, then you need continuing development in order to maintain relative fitness or in order to maintain the status quo. So in order for a virus to continue to infect a species, it's going to put 
uh, pathogenic viruses particularly, are going to put the host under selective pressure. So when they do that, the host is obliged to change, gain the advantage, and become relatively less susceptible to infection. This will then put the virus under pressure because the host has the advantage, and the virus is then obliged to change to regain the advantage, and the selective pressure goes back to the status quo. So we imagine this occurring, and we can uh, show that different species, uh, Trim5 from different species, has different price spry sequences. In fact, the price spry of Trim5 is evolving extremely fast, uh, one of the fastest evolving genes in the, in the human genome, or the mammalian genome, rather. So they can mutate and gain the advantage, restrict the virus. So for example, we can restrict some MLVs, we can restrict a horse virus, we're not too good at restricting HIV-1. If we can restrict a virus and we're exposed to it consistently, the virus may well, uh, we may select a variant which is not restricted by Trim5 through the virus changing its capsid sequence. Under those circumstances, some species, a couple of uh, monkeys, appear to have swapped out their price bri for cyclophilin A, allowing restriction and regaining the advantage. The virus can mutate capsid again and escape, but the virus, the, the host can now mutate the cyclophilin, and it can do it in uh, strange ways that give it this conformational diversity regaining the advantage. And we imagine this uh, business uh, going on and on throughout evolution. And we can show that cyclophilins in different species have changed sequence, and, and uh, particularly when they're attached to the end of trim five. So uh, very, uh, we, we really like the Red Queen hypothesis and how that describes our work. So um, uh, one uh, useful aspect of all of this is this uh, notion of gluing cyclophilin A onto the end of trim five has suggested the fact that we can actually do gene therapy and treat HIV patients by recapitulating this, uh, this evolution that's occurred in monkeys by fusing human TRIM5 to human cyclophilin A and expressing that in a gene therapy context. And that humanized protein very potently restricts HIV-1 infectivity. Uh, Jeremy Lubin's lab actually took this into a, a humanized mouse model and could show that the trim sit was very good at blocking HIV infection. And uh, together with colleagues at Great Ormond Street and also with some help from Jeremy, we're going to try and see if we can actually put this into patients at some point. Uh, an advantage of this approach over other gene therapy approaches, I think, is that we're actually recapitulating something that has evolved twice in primates. So that must work. And I don't think we fully understand why it's so effective, but we can be sure that it is effective. So what does all this that we've learned about host virus interactions tell us about uh, any aspect of nuclear, of uh, HIV biology? So we have uh, been considering uh, why uh, TRIMSIP uh, evolved. Why is cyclophilin A such a good uh, and effective uh, domain to attach to the restriction factor? Why has that evolved twice? So to kind of... Um, examine this and, and think about this, a uh, postdoc in my lab, Torsten Schaller, uh, did the following experiment. So he took the human TRIM5 protein and he stuck on the end of it a variety of different human cyclophilins to test which ones could restrict HIV and therefore that would be a surrogate for finding out which cyclophilins could functionally bind incoming HIV-1. So I didn't think this experiment would be terribly informative, I must say, but Torsten went ahead and did this. And uh, what he found was that, in fact, most cyclophilins can uh, act as a recruitment domain. So the owl monkey cyclophilin works pretty well. That's not surprising because that's uh, evolved as a molecule. The human cyclophilin A actually works even better. Cyclophilin B uh, works a bit, but not that well. Cyclophilin E works quite well. And in each case, we can rescue infectivity by treating... Uh, the cells with a cyclophilin binding inhibitor. So this is a cyclic peptide called cyclosporin, which can uh, recruit to most cyclophilins and stop them binding their targets. So that rescues infectivity. So the really interesting result in this experiment was the fact that this protein, NUP358, has a cyclophilin-like domain, it's called, and that cyclophilin-like domain, when it is attached to TRIM5, gives a pretty decent restriction. But most importantly, that is not really rescued by treatment of the cells with cyclosporin. And that's important because we thought that we understood what happens when you block cyclophilin interactions because we knew what happens when you block, when you add cyclosporin to HIV infection. And the fact is, in cell lines at least, not much. It's not a very potent inhibitor. So we know cyclophilin binds the HIV capsid, but if you stop it doing it, not much happens, at least in cell lines. <coughs> 
But here we could see that adding cyclosporin did not reveal the effect of NUP358 binding uh, HIV-1. And that was interesting because uh, uh, NUP358 is a nuclear pore protein. So as you all know, HIV is able to infect uh, non-dividing cells, presumably by taking the pre-integration complex through nuclear pores, whereas gamma retroviruses like MLV can't do that. And a consequence of that is that uh, lentiviruses can infect cells that don't divide, whereas gamma retroviruses cannot. But how HIV gets through the nuclear pore has been pretty controversial over the years and uh, pretty poorly understood. So we thought that the fact that we had a nuclear pore protein that recruited the capsid directly might be involved in HIV nuclear entry. So NUP358 is a, a really big uh, monster of a protein. It's 358 kilodaltons. It has a series of enzymatic functions along its length, and it has a cyclophilin-like domain at the very C-terminus. And it forms what are called fibers on the outside of the nuclear pore. So you get about eight of these per a nuclear pore complex, and uh, the, uh, the cyclophilin-like domain is right on the end. Uh, NUP358 has been shown to have uh, E3 ligase activity uh, for SUMO, which is a ubiquitin-like molecule. Uh, SUMO is thought to be involved in nuclear entry. It's clear that NUP358 is somehow involved in nuclear entry, perhaps through selecting uh, transporter choice, so perhaps through uh, sorting cargoes into particular transporter pathways as they go through the nuclear pore. But it's a difficult protein to work with because it's so big, it's difficult to knock it down, etc., and uh, certainly difficult to express it. So not a great deal is known about it. So the first thing we did was demonstrate that the NUP358 cyclophilin-like domain really can truly bind the HIV capsid, and this is another ITC experiment from Leo and his PhD student, Amanda Price. And again, cyclophilin A has a seven micromolar KD with capsid, and the NUP358 KD is a little bit weaker, but uh, in the similar range. Leo, Leo also solved the crystal structure of the NUP358 cyclophilin-like domain in complex with the N-terminal domain of the HIV capsid, P24. And you can see that the structure that came from the Sunquist and Hill labs of uh, the uh, N-terminal capsid in complex with cyclophilin A is almost identical to the crystal structure with NUP358. So that suggested to us that, in fact, HIV may really be focusing on binding NUP358 rather than cyclophilin A. But I think, uh, more recently, we think that binding with both of these proteins is important for HIV replication. So suffice to say, the uh, NUP358 cyclophilin domain binds capsid. So is it important as an HIV cofactor for infection? So our favorite approach for doing that kind of experiment is to deplete proteins using RNAi. So uh, it's important to note that we are doing this in stable cells. We've made stable HeLa cell clones that express short, ha short hairpin RNAs from a lentiviral or a gamma retroviral vector. And uh, we've knocked down NUP358 pretty well, I think. And when we do that, we see that HIV has a drop in titer of about six to eight fold. So not very big, and that was a surprise. You think if you knock something down that's important for nuclear entry, you'd get a bigger phenotype. But in fact, we get about a six to eight defold in in defect in titer. If we knock down the transporter protein that has been, uh, there's a variety of evidence from different labs that transportin-3 is the transporter protein that takes the pre-integration complex across the nuclear pore. So if we knock down transportin-3, we find that uh, we get a similar defect, a little bit stronger, but a similar defect. siv mac is a simian lentivirus that doesn't bind cyclophilins, and consistent with that, it is not sensitive to NUP358 knockdown, but is sensitive to the transporter knockdown. So it seems in the case of SIV MAC, that's able to get into the nucleus using transportin 3, but without really being dependent on NUP358. And a gamma retrovirus, MLV, does not go through the nuclear pore and is not uh, sensitive to either of these knockdowns. So, that, so far, so good. Now, we started to get surprises when we started to think about how else to measure nuclear entry. So typically, people measure nuclear entry by measuring the formation of DNA circles. So DNA circles are formed by uh, either uh, the non-homologous end joining pathway or through some kind of recombination events in the nucleus. And they're thought to only occur in the nucleus because the enzymes required for this are only found in the nucleus. So you can measure these as a surrogate for nuclear entry. So we did that, and we found that two LTR circles do take a dip when we knock the, down NUP358 or transportin-3, but that drop of two to three fold 
does not account for in this experiment. So these are done in parallel. We do PCR at 15 hours and 23 hours, and then a parallel sample we measure uh, GFP positive cells uh, after uh, 48 hours. And you can see that a tenfold defect in infectivity is represented by a twofold or threefold defect in circles. So that suggested that we're not particularly impacting on circle formation, but we are impacting on the ability to form a provirus. And so I'm showing that data now, but I'll discuss our interpretation of that towards the end of the talk. So that was a surprise. Another surprise was it was relatively easy for us to make mutants that were no longer able to uh, use NUP358 or transbuilt-in-3 in some cases, but were perfectly infectious. So these are, again, VSVG pseudotypes being tightened onto HeLa cells with stable knockdowns of these proteins. And we can see we get a defect with NUP358 knockdown and transbuilt-in-3 on wild-type NL43. But if we make a cyclophilin binding mutant, P90A, mutate the proline that cyclophilin binds to an alanine, we find it's no longer sensitive to NUP358, but the titer is pretty good. So it's not disadvantaged by not binding NUP358. It, and it gets a little bit less sensitive to transporting three knockdown. We found that another mutant, N57A, which is down in all cases. So this is more like what we would expect. We would expect that a virus that can't interact with these proteins would be uh, less infectious, and that's the case here. But then uh, Vinit Kirill Romani's lab identified a mutant in capsid, N74D, which was completely insensitive to knockdown of these proteins and yet retained similar titer to the wild-type virus. So that suggested that these proteins weren't important, that transporting 3 and NUP358 might be used by the wild-type virus, but it can easily get into the nucleus and replicate using other pathways. And Vinit and colleagues interpreted that as there being flexible use of nuclear import pathways by HIV. So we started to wonder whether we were making the right measurements, whether we were measuring the right thing. So uh, we know uh, Rick Bushman through uh, seeing Rick at various meetings, and we knew that Rick had spent some time uh, sequencing HIV integration sites, and he'd shown that HIV doesn't integrate randomly into the genome, but in fact targets genes. And not only that, it tends to target or favor integration into regions of the genome that have a particular gene density of about 15 genes per megabase. So we asked Rick if he would sequence integration sites from our mutants. And we made the rather surprising observation that with the cyclophilin binding mutants, so here's two cyclophilin binding mutants, G89V, P90A, both pretty infectious, we get a higher gene density, implying that if you use a different pathway of nuclear entry, you go to a different part of chromatin and integrate with different preferences into the genome. And then perhaps even more surprisingly, with these other two mutants, N57A and N74D, we found that the uh, gene density of these guys when you sequence the integration sites was pretty much what you find if you randomly pick out genes out of the genome. So these guys appeared to be still going into genes, but randomly, and these guys seem to be going into even more gene-rich regions. And, and very reliably. So working out uh, how to statistically support this is a very uh, complicated business. And I must say Rick's labs, particularly a guy called Chuck Berry in Rick's lab, uh, really took care of this, a statistician. And we came up with a number of things that we can measure. So what we do is we put a, a one megabase window around these, each integration site and make a certain number of measurements. So for example, uh, Gene boundaries, are these integrating into genes? Yes, they are. So if it gets hotter, the color goes redder, and if it gets colder, it goes bluer. You've got the wild type in the middle, and the ones that go less dense are these guys, and the ones that go more dense are these guys. And when you see uh, the stars, they are about the statistical support for that change being uh, real. So we're making a series of measurements. We're looking at DNA's hypersensitivity sites. We're looking at CPG islands, gene density, expression density. So are the hotter regions actually expressed more? We're looking at gene con uh, GC content. But I think in all reality, what we're measuring is really all measures of gene density. Uh, gene dense regions tend to have more expression per gene, as I understand it. And so whether we're really measuring anything beyond gene density is not clear. But what is certainly true is very reliably, these mutants get hotter and these mutants get colder from the wild type. So we genuinely believe that we are retargeting integration through altering the, the pathway through which they go through the nucleus. So as I said, if you do single round infectivity experiments on HeLa, these mutants are pretty infectious. But if you do spreading infection assays in primary cells, 
such as uh, monocyte-derived macrophages in this case, these mutants really do not replicate. So they might do okay on HeLa cells, but they really do not do so well in primary cells. And I think it's important to uh, be aware of the fact that the criteria by which HIV has to operate in HeLa cells is likely quite different from how it has to operate in T cells and macrophages. So what does cyclophilin have to do with all of this? So um, we are able to separate cyclophilin binding from NUP358 binding using the drug cyclosporin, because as I said earlier, cyclosporin will inhibit cyclophilin A binding, but it does not inhibit NUP358 binding to the capsid. So the core should still recruit. So we can do the following experiment. As, a, as before, we can knock down transport in three and we get a defect in infectivity, and we can knock down NUP358 and we get a defect in infectivity that's a little less. And then we can throw on cyclosporin and see what happens then. So block cyclophilin binding in the absence of these two proteins. When we do that, we find, remarkably, we completely rescue the infectivity defect caused by NUP358 knockdown and largely rescue the infectivity defect caused by transport in three knockdown. <coughs> so that tells us that the virus doesn't care about using these proteins if you stop it binding to cyclophilin A. And we, can, we know that cyclophilin A is the, is the uh, protein uh, of importance in this experiment because we can recapitulate that observation with RNAi. So if we do integration site sequencing again, we can show that G89V, a cyclophilin binding mutant, gets hotter and the wild type gets hotter in more or less the same way if you add cyclosporin. So blocking cyclophilin binding by mutation or by blocking it by adding the drug has the same effect on integration targeting. And here's a dendrogram that groups these uh, treatments according to their integration preferences. And you can see that the G89V is not particularly altered by adding cyclosporin. It stays pink, it stays getting hotter, and the wild type becomes like that if we add cyclosporin to that. So also, another final observation before I present a model is that cyclosporin is very effective at blocking replication in primary macrophages. So if you treat uh, primary macrophages with cyclosporin, they really cannot replicate HIV-1, whereas if you add uh, HIV-1, it infects all the cells and then gradually they lies. I think the cyclosporin was a bit toxic in these experiments, the DMSO rather, was a bit toxic in these experiments. But we can, we can certainly show that cyclosporin is a potent inhibitor of HIV replication in primary macrophages. So how can we put all of this together as a model for HIV replication? So this is, this is what we've come up with. So we perceive the uh, capsid of HIV-1 as being like a submarine. So its job is to uh, have the uh, process of reverse transcription to go on inside the capsid. We think that the reverse transcription goes on inside that guy. And the reason for that is because uh, I don't think that uh, primary immune cells would tolerate the uh, conversion of RNA into double-stranded DNA uh, without spotting it as a uh, pathogen-associated molecular pattern. And so we hypothesize that the, the role of the capsid is to hide that. Now, if you look in a textbook, it describes HIV as coming into cells and then coming apart, but we don't think that that's what happens. We think that the infectious guys, the ones that make proviruses, are the ones that stay together. Now, HIV is kind of wasteful, we think, and we think that when it infects cells, you have to have quite a few uh, virions in order to form a, a provirus. So we interpret that as HIV. There are various things that can happen to the, these cones when they go inside the cells, and some of them are good for the virus and lead to provirus formation, and some are not. So we hypothesize that the role of cyclophilin is to <coughs> stabilize the capsid, and that leads it to uh, remain intact until it reaches the nuclear pore. If the cyclophilin does not bind, then the virus comes apart, reverse transcription probably occurs in the cytoplasm, and is non-productive. And we hypothesize that this cyclophilin-coated virion, or cone, arrives at the nuclear pore and interacts with NUP358. Leo's lab can show that the NUP358 cyclophilin is actually capable of isomerizing the uh, capsid protein. So perhaps that process leads to uncoating. We think that probably the process of reverse transcription itself also aids uncoating because the DNA is too big to fit inside the cone. 
So it probably goes on, we believe it goes on at the nuclear pore. So the guys that form a provirus reverse transcribe in complex with the nuclear pore. And famously, Pierre Charnot's lab uh, showed intact cones by electron microscopy at nuclear pores, and nobody really believed that they were functional uh, reverse transcription complexes. We believe they are, we believe that Pierre was right, and that that's where uh, reverse transcription occurs. That breaking open the capsid then allows the uh, integrase protein to bind transportin-3. Ziga de Beiser's lab and uh, his postdocs, particularly Rick Gisbos, has shown that uh, integrase is uh, able to bind uh, the uh, transportin-3 protein. If you make mutants in capsid, you stop this recruitment and you stop integrase binding the transportin-3. And that could explain how uh, you can make a mutant in capsid and yet impact on the ability of these two proteins to interact because they don't get the chance if you don't recruit to the nuclear pore. We know that HIV integrates into active chromatin and we hypothesize that this happens really at the nuclear pore. And that again was another reason to come and talk to uh, Mauro and uh, Marina because uh, their student, Bruno, as you know, has shown that uh, HIV does uh, integrate into chromatin at the nuclear pore. And we think the reason that it does this is because it really, it's really important that it doesn't start floating around in the nucleus. That would give it a way to integrate into chromatin. So when looking at the bigger picture, we think that most of the cores don't go down this pathway. Most of them, perhaps I'm pulling thing, uh, numbers out of the air at this point, but let's say a large number of them, perhaps 99%, all of them, if you make the N74D mutant and stop recruitment to this pathway, uncoat in the cytoplasm. Much of the DNA is degraded by TREX. That's been shown by DNA uh, uh, by Judy Lieberman's lab. If you block this DNA getting degraded, as you might predict, you activate pattern recognition because these guys get seen in the cytoplasm. And we think that this route of uh, going in a kind of non-specific way, there's probably a large number of redundant nuclear entry pathways that will import DNA into the nucleus. It's also evidenced by the fact that cells that are most easy to transfect are the ones that are most permissive to infection. And all of that stuff forms uh, DNA circles and we think the ones that do manage to integrate, integrate randomly. So if we make mutants like N74D that go down this pathway, we don't really affect circle formation, and in cell lines, we don't really affect titer. All we affect is the fact that they're now randomly integrating. So that's, uh, that's our model now, and we think that uh, if a virus, if you study a biochemistry of uncoating, then you will see it all going on in the cytoplasm but we don't think they're the ones that actually make it. We think they're responsible for um, the circles. And remember, if you knock down members of this pathway, again, you don't really impact on circles. It's maybe down to a threefold, but you, they're still forming, and you're still getting quite a lot of integration. Integration events are down by about 5x, and those integration events are random. So that's how we, how we put this pathway together, and that's uh, currently our hypothesis. So to summarize, TRIM5, we think, is continuously self-ubiquitating, but ubiquitin species are short-lived uh, and only revealed by enrichment or by inhibiting their turnover in the proteasome. They incur independently, but are absolutely required for restriction of viral DNA synthesis. So they're not required for restriction of infection because the TRIM can still coat the particle in the absence of ubiquitin, but it, in order to recruit the proteasome, it requires the uh, ubiquitination uh, Jeremy Lubin's lab has described, so what are the ubiquitin species for? Well, Jeremy's uh, described TRIM5 as a pattern recognition receptor, and it's uh, highly possible, I think, that these ubiquitin species, their job is to activate innate immunity. So something changes when they bind the capsid, and that leads to activation of innate immunity. So TRIM5 acts both as a sensor and an uh, antiviral molecule. So I think that TRIM5's main job might actually be to sense viral infection. Restricting viral infection is all very well, but what you really want to do is to sense it, cause interferon production, and generate an antiviral state, which will protect the host rather than the cell individually. Uh, the TRIM5 is adapted by fusing to cyclophilin A, and that seems to make a very res uh, flexible restriction factor, and the Red Queen hypothesis accurately predicts these things. We think that 358 and transportin 3 are cofactors for HIV-1, and we think that their conserved use underlies the conservation of cyclophilin interactions. So these viruses all bind uh, NUP358 cyclophilin. So we think it's a common mechanism by which 
uh, virus has entered the nucleus, and that's why cyclophilin is so uh, effective as an antiviral binding molecule, because the virus struggles to not bind cyclophilins and get into the nucleus. And we think that redirecting HIV nuclear entry away from NUP358 leads to an inability to replicate in primary macrophages, demonstrating these pathways are really important in primary cells. We think that uh, we hypothesize that NUP358 tethers an intact core at the nuclear pore whilst uncoating takes place. That is, uh, uncoating is driven by reverse transcription and possibly isomerization. And we think that this uncoating step reveals the PIC via integrase to transport in three, which assures integration into preferred sites. So if we stop it binding NUP358, then it tends to use transport in three less well, not because the transport in three binds capsid, but that capsid takes it to the process where it's handed over to transport in three. And I think it's important that when we're looking at virus host interactions, virus proteins never want to bind host proteins very tightly or become too dependent on them, because if a host can get hold of a virus, then it can do something bad to the virus. And I think a good example of that is the virus has become obliged to bind cyclophilin A, allowing or obliged to bind NUP358 cyclophilin, and that allows the host to manipulate that to its advantage and use that uh, dependency uh, to generate restriction factors. And we hope that uh, we can use this knowledge to develop restriction factors. Retargeting integration is a very interesting notion in terms of uh, gene therapy applications where you might want to retarget uh, out of genes, and it seems that mutating capsid may be a way to do that. And we wonder if you can drug this pathway. What happens when you drug cyclophilin A? Can you drug NUP358 specifically? Can you generate uh, HIV inhibitors? So thanks to all the people who have done all the work. Torsten, uh, Laura, and Laura have done most of the NUP358 work. Uh, Adam has done the TRIM5 work. Uh, we're very dependent on Rick's uh, sequencing facility at Penn. Uh, Rick has been a great collaborator in that. Uh, uh, Leo and Amanda, particularly also at the LMB in Cambridge, do all the crystallography and the uh, uh, ITC and biophysics experiments, which have been very important in understanding mechanism. And we do the gene therapy with Wasim at Great Ormond Street. And uh, thanks also to Vineet and colleagues at UCL for reagents and advice. And I'm mostly funded by the Wellcome Trust. Thank you. <coughs>